Hello guys, I'm Philip Magnus and today I'm going to talk about Tyranny Act 1. But before that, I have a question. How do I start to talk about a game that has scored basically every major box in my list of things done right in a role-playing game? Well, perhaps some background is in order. Tyranny is a story where you, the player, take on the role of a fate binder. But what is a fate binder? Well, you are basically a judge, jury, executioner, and occasional errand boy to Karas, the evil overlord, who has done what Sauron and Voldemort, those pesky loudmouths, never could. She has taken over the world. With a mastery of all powerful magic, Karas's edict spells, the overlord rules uncontested. Act 1 picks off after two of Karas' archons, the leaders of the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus respectively, managed a semi-successful invasion of the Tears, which is basically this last part of Teratus, still not officially under Karas' rule. I say officially, because the Tearsmen use the same language, currency, and their culture isn't too far from the one on the Karas. At any rate, before you start the game, you can make several choices in the Conquest mode, which will greatly enhance and change the state of the world. Basically, you will be suffering from consequences of those choices for the bigger part of the game, or at least for all of Act 1. I suspect that it goes over Act 1, however. Um, so, what I'm trying to say here is choose wisely and choose with care. Your choices will matter. The game starts after you do the whole conquesting, with you bringing a terrible edict to the two Archons, the voices of Nerat and Graven Arsh. The edict is a direct response to a rebellion that the two commanders seem unable to crush, mainly because of their uh, bickering and constant rising hatred and loathing for one another. Karas' message, in pragmatic overlord fashion, is End the rebellion, or all within the tears will die, including you guys. Oh, and Osu, you, the fate binder, who unfortunately end up as the expendable errand boy. What happens in the very first scene once you click that start game button is that the pass you just pass through to get to the tears. Haha, <laughs> get it? Pass through which you pass through. Anyway, it basically becomes inaccessible. Thank you, Karis. Well then, that's about enough background for you folks. The basic gist of the first act is that you have eight days until Karis' Day of Swords, during which the edict you just carried to the Archons is basically going to activate and murder everyone. And I suspect that you don't want that to happen. Although there is an achievement if you do not stop the Outbreakers, so... Anyway, it sounds easier than it is. Rising tensions between the restrained, honourable, graven Ash and the absolutely insane, albeit hilarious, voices of Nerat, much could be said about either of these characters. And I have a feeling that I'll take my time to discuss them in their own videos. But the most important thing to understand is that these Arkans factions are reflections of their very leaders. The Disfavored are a small professional army, clad in iron professional... I already said that... and merciless. They are basically very, very much going to make you feel like a hero and like an honourable man, which is kind of going to tilt your perception of what you are doing. You're going to forget just how evil some of the things you do are if you follow them. The Scarlet Chorus, unlike them, 
Ah, yes, uh, the disfavored are always also very picky about who they include in their ranks, unlike the Scarlet Chorus. The voices of Nerat's faction and followers, they are, let's just say, hmm, 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 absolutely insane. And like a microcosm of the worst that Darwinism has to offer. Constant power plays, advancement through killing, and, I don't know, an overall hostile work environment. Let's just say that it doesn't awake my faith in humanity. And there is something strangely charming about that psychotic bunch, which I ended up choosing. Maybe because they don't hide who they are through noble means and through noble language and through this uh, feeling of superiority that the disfavored have. Plus, it's mainly because of the fun as hell companion slash assassin slash elite Scarlet Chorus soldier slash Scarlet Fury verse versus the very first companion you unlock and suffice to say she is a lot of chaotic murderous fun. Speaking of choice, say goodbye to the binary good guy, bad guy decisions you've gotten used to in Bioware's Dragon Age or Mass Effect games, and as well as a bunch of other RPGs that have similar choices. Serving a bad guy, in this case a bad girl, since Skylus is a she, means making tough decisions some of which can be downright evil, but that's okay, being a bad guy isn't all bad, and it is where tyranny excels at, in so many different ways. If you want a game which can show you evil in an entirely, well not an entirely, but in a new light, in a unique and ambitious way, tyranny is the game for you, and its first act is going to give you plenty of opportunity to do some wretched evil things, as well as some small acts of kindness, of course, like telling the truth to a sorceress or many other choices that really you wouldn't expect in most other games, or any games, really. Take the skills usage, for example. If you have an athletics of, let's say, 35, you can basically go towards an enemy, grab him and choke him in your hands if he displeases you. Which kind of sounds Star Wars-ish. Yes, actually, if you like the dark side and sit, tyranny is probably for you. Huh. As well as, there are many options with other skills involved and your background which you choose from, I believe, 10 or 12 different options. I personally went to with the noble backstory because it seemed to fit my power fantasy. And what are these games if not an outlet for your power fantasies? So go ahead and, you know, play it and let's see what you'll come up with. Tell me about it in the comments. At any rate, you've probably gotten it from my voice. But I'm really happy with Tyranny so far. It's much shorter than Obsidian Entertainment's last entry in the RPG genre, Pillars of Eternity, which I still haven't finished, by the way. Tyranny is a mere 20 to 30 hour experience, whereas I've seen people put in pillars anywhere from 100 to basically 500 hours, which I have no idea how you can do that, but congrats, mate. Um. A lot of the time you'll spend in Tyranny is basically reading text, but boy, what a good text! The writing of Tyranny is absolutely fantastic with this moral ambiguity I already spoke about, and a general feeling, an ambience, which reminds me a lot of the Malas and Books of the Fallen, which if you haven't read, you should particularly in its use of everyday language between soldiers. The dialogue in Tyranny doesn't come off as 
pretentious, but rather as very realistic, which I realize is a word that doesn't fit much with the topic of a game about an evil judicator who does his overlord's will, and yet that's exactly what it is. The characters are so much fun! The two Archons are really colourful characters. Sorry, I'm using characters way too much. They are really interesting. Their minions are also nothing less than a trill. Verse Lantry and I believe Barrick, or is it Boric? I have it written down, written down somewhere. Ah oh, yes, Barrick. Those are the three companions you unlock during the first act. You also unlock Ebb at the very end of it, but I don't really know much about her yet, so I'm not going to discuss her here. Anyway, Verse is the slightly psychotic girl with the heart of gold. Lantry is a sage from this library which you have the option of basically burning down with an Edict of Kairos at the very start, in, during the conquest. And Barak is a disfavored who can't remove his armor, because he was in the middle of another Edict, which did things to... Well, basically he managed to survive, but only because of some strange occurrence that locked him in his armor. Which is cool, which is nice. I don't blame him, he's a really tanky character, but also he is very much a bigot and he is he has a superiority complex. Not at all too pleasant once you strip away the nobility of basically the disfavored, which is what a lot of the members of that faction are, really. Which is not to say that the Scarlet Chorus faction is better, I mean, versus a psycho, and she doesn't hide it, and neither do most of the other Scarlet Chorus members. Which is really impressive and amazing that I find them so charming while they are absolutely bonkers. While well, each of these characters have only about one-tenth of their dialogue voiced, all the companion voice actors are nothing less than stellar. They give you just enough for you to build a basis, a foundation of how the characters sound and behave and about their personalities, and then they let you read on all the minutia, all the tiny, interesting, fascinating details, which you can go without, of course. It's really a great way to handle characters, the same way, in fact, that they used in Pillars of Eternity, and I do believe that one of the actors, at least, makes a return from Obsidian Entertainment's 2015 game. Now, a bit about combat and I still haven't made my mind up about it, but you've probably seen some footage of it by now, and it's safe to say that, compared to Pillars of Eternity, the combat system is a lot more simplified, a lot faster, easier to get into, spells are cooldown based instead of limited per every rest you make with your characters, rests really are used only to cure wounds and for a very limited array of opportunities which you can unlock by having either more favor or rat with your companions as well as having more favor or rat with factions with factions though you unlock passive abilities whereas with companions you unlock active ones which is all fun game. All of these abilities which you unlock like that, they are insanely more powerful than I think the magic is. The magic is weak, it is not all that interesting, although it has an, a fairly fascinating, yeah, let's go with a fascinating concept 
of preparing your spells, which I will go more in depth at a later date once I know more about it. Tyranny's first act has presented a big fascinating world, which doesn't annoy with its writing. Actually, it's the very opposite. The writing is exceptional and you're going to fall absolutely in love with it. I know I did and I know that I need to play more of it. It allows you to take on a perspective that has never quite been done before. Not like this, anyway. You may go with some trite argument that's overlord and so on and so forth. Did let you go in the shoes of a villain, but that doesn't really... It doesn't have anything to do with what is going on in Tyranny. The first act has only managed to whet my appetite and to make me want to play further. I will be returning with more comments, more videos about Tyranny, because honestly this game is a lot of fun and I'm probably going to replay it three times, because I can see three, maybe even four routes which I really want to take so far, and who knows, maybe there will be more in the future. Anyway, thank you guys for watching, this was fun, and I hope to see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share and subscribe. If not, send it to the guys and gals you hate and make their day worse or better. Bye! We had not anticipated you would be twice honored with the task of proclamation. So, do not keep us waiting. What is the Overlord's will? The Overlord means to compel us into action. No doubt the avalanches in the mountains are part of this ultimatum. We must conquer the Oathbreakers or die in failure. There is no room for error, and no other way out of this valley alive. We'll need to advance across the Matani. We lose everything if we stand still. And we move to back up Plan Green. The Earthshakers didn't make it over the mountain in time. So we do this the hard way. Over the walls, instead of through. So you found your backbone at last! Oh, we were worried past humiliations would make you soft, timid. That was a record for you, right? The Baker's Dozen lost in one sortie. If you had waited for the chorus reinforcements, maybe we'd have eyes and ears on the matter.